thank you very much. Um, I hope you've all got the Legos Treatment Revolution book, and a lot of what I'm going to tell you is actually in there. Um, a lot of people might not like it at first, but I would encourage you to read it, because it tells you a lot of things, and it's based on the new randomised controlled studies and the NICE guidelines. So in other words, it's not my personal opinion, most of it, a bit of it is my personal opinion, but it's actually all based on what is going to become uh, very important to you, especially if you read the first two cases where those patients have actually sued their district nurses, uh, GPs, and in one case dermatologists for not following the guidelines. So it is very important. I uh, published that in 2018. The cases have now gone through and in fact you've successfully sued and were tested in court. We can come on to that in a bit if you want to if there's time and questions. But what I'm going to try and talk to you today about is the current investigations of venous disease. And one of the most easy things to do in that sort of thing would just be to put up all the investigations and talk to you about them, and that wouldn't be particularly interesting. So I'm going to try and take it in a bit, hopefully a bit more of a way of understanding. Just to give you a bit of credibility as to who I am, I'm, as you heard, I'm a consultant in surgery, I'm one of the only in the country. Almost everybody in the country who treats veins is a vascular surgeon, which means an artery surgeon. Those doctors hardly ever come to vein conferences, and I see very, very few English doctors ever at vein conferences around the world. Um, and we'll come to a couple of ways you tell the difference very soon. Um, but that's one of the reasons why patients in the UK have such bad venous care, is because there's no consultant venous surgeon in the NHS. Therefore, there's no training in medical school or colleges for veins, and therefore the, the country in the UK runs about 20 years behind what is current in all of the conferences we go to around the world. Um, <coughs> my unit, of course, is because we understand that and we do a lot of the original research, I'm asked to go and, and lecture on these, and because of that, we're actually at the cutting edge of what's going on in the world. So there's a bit of a gulf, which is why I hardly ever speak in England. In fact, I only come here because Ellie asked me to, but I don't speak at academic conferences in the UK because it's just a waste of time. So I run a thing called the College of Phobology. If you're interested in veins and venous things, you can become an associate member of that. We run all sorts of education. And we do that because there is no education in the UK on veins of any note. Uh, we've set up, I've invented some instruments, and I've uh, working with um, a couple of engineers and uh, about to get our first device out um, uh, with CMARC and FDA in early next year. And we publish lots of books and peer-reviewed uh, journals, etc. Right, so investigations. When we're talking about what investigation are we going to do for venous disease, the first thing you want to know is what are you looking for? And it sounds stupid, but lots of doctors, you know, lots of patients all the time sort of often go to a doctor and say, you know, I want an x-ray, I want a blood test, because they think that's what they want. But in fact, it, if it's not the right test for the right problem, then of course you're not going to get... If you're not having the right test, if you're not understanding what you're looking for, then you're not going to get the right test, you won't get the right outcome. And the second thing, which I, when I was writing this, I thought I'd put up with the tease at the beginning, but I hope all of you would actually know the answer to that straight away, is clinical examination good enough, and it's not. Uh, you cannot tell when you examine somebody clinically, even if you do an ABPI, you do not know enough about that patient to be able to start compressing them, treating them or anything. And that's and if you try to, you're breaking the NICE guidelines. And if you haven't read the NICE guidelines, do read the NICE guidelines, because they've been out since 2013. It's the NICE CG168, and it is the NICE guidelines on varicose veins. And the trouble is, because it's varicose veins, a lot of people don't think it's related to leg ulcers. But in the recommendations for varicose veins, it says very clearly every single patient who has got a venous leg ulcer, which is a break in the skin for two weeks or more, even if it's healed, must be referred for a venous nucleus ulcer. And if you don't do that, you're not following the guidelines. Now we can talk, if there's some questions afterwards about the fact you can't get hold of it, etc., etc., but as professionals, make sure you've tried to make the referral, and make sure it's written in the notes that you've tried to. And I would encourage you to read the first case in that book as well as to, as to what happens in the book. So it is a very, very important change that's happened over the last 10 years. Right, so what is venous disease? One of the most important things to remember about venous disease, the trouble in the UK is, as I say, because it's not been a very sexy subject, people have always looked at varicose veins as just you know, cosmetic and thought of leg ulcers as something completely different. It's not. It's a continuum of disease in many patients. Not all, but many. The most important thing to remember about all venous disease is venous disease causes inflammation. Inflammation is very good for you if it's acute, it's very bad for you if it's chronic. Very, very simply, if you have a boil or a small abscess and you see redness in it, heat, uh, um, swelling and tenderness, that's your four things of inflammation, you will think that's because of the infection. It is not. 
the redness, heat, swelling and tenderness is your body fighting the infection, it is healing, okay? You can tell that because if you give steroids to anybody with that, you'll get rid of all of that and the patient will die of septicemia. So the point is, is when you see, and doctors and nurses always do this incorrectly, they look at, they see some hot red, uh, tender and sore, and they think that is infection. And they don't think to themselves that that is actually the body's response to infection. And that's really, really important because when somebody's had surgery and they've got a hot red sore in the tender area, it's often due to the fact they've had uh, surgery. And it's only if it's abnormal that there might be a superadded infection. So always remember that you're talking acute inflammation is good for you. It's very, very powerful, it's very strong, but it kills all the bugs, it puts everything back in the right order to heal. Where it goes wrong is when it becomes chronic. So if you keep getting acute inflammation again and again, like sarcoidosis, like rheumatoid arthritis, you actually can destroy normal tissue by having chronic inflammation. Why that's relevant to you is if you don't treat veins and you have venous inflammation, you will cause damage at the ankle and you will end up with swelling. Then you will end up with skin damage, hypodermatosclerosis, hemocytium deposition, and leg ulcer. And if you're trained, which you have been up to now, looking at the leg ulcer and making assessment of the leg ulcer, and is it green, is it pink, what do I put on it? That's rubbish. What you should be thinking of is, why have I got the inflammation? Why did it occur? And what am I going to do about it to try and cure it? So the surface thing and everything, that's fine for nursing care today, you know, what dressing am I going to use for comfort? But it's nothing to do with getting your patient out of trouble, okay? So, venous disease, when you say venous disease, everyone sort of sort of thinks about various disease, DVTs maybe or something, you have to be very precise. So you have reflux, you have stasis, and you have obstruction. Those are the three areas of venous disease we know about. Usually, you have more than one. Very few people only have one of those causes. So there is a bit of a mixture, and reflux is passive or active. If any of you, I uh, doubt if you bother, I wouldn't bother if you really want, unless you want to do it. If any of you go into actually how we treat veins, the northern hemisphere tend to use ablative surgery, so we use lasers, radio frequency, everything like that. That's what I bought into the country in 1999. However, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you don't do that. You actually reroute the blood, and you do a thing called hemodynamic surgery or shiva. It's a completely different methodology, a completely different understanding, and I think it's also wrong, and I argue with the man who invented it quite a lot. Uh, both on the internet and face to face. Uh, but if you're interested, read it. But I wouldn't bother because uh, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> but if you ever read any of that, if you hear people talk about diastolic or systolic reflux, that's what they mean. So I'll go a bit further into that in a minute. But all of it, remember the common final pathway, the thing that actually destroys and causes the ulcers, causes the problems, is chronic inflammation. And that's what we have to consider. Now, first of all, what do we know about veins? So we have to go a little bit into science before we can think about what investigations we want. And the science is very simple in some ways. When the blood whizzes around your body, it goes through the capillaries. When it comes out of the capillaries in your feet and ankles, it has still a bit of pressure in it of 15 millimeters of mercury. When you're lying flat, your heart is at zero degrees uh, millimeters of mercury. And so if you lie a patient flat, they will heal their leg ulcers. And one of the ways that I actually used to treat when I was an NHS consultant, I used to put patients, if there was ever any doubt, is this arterial or is it venous or something else, put the patient into bed, elevate the bed a little bit to help them, give them heparin so they don't get into DVT, do not put any dressings on it at all, because then you don't know if you've got an allergic reaction to the dressing or if you've got any, um, um, any maceration of the skin which causes the ulcers to look bigger. And you don't need it, because if your legs are up, you're not going to get an exudate. So you don't need to worry about it. So if you've got to have an edema crust up, if it's a venous ulcer, it will start to heal. Within a few days, you just start to see it heal. It's a great way of healing ulcers. The trouble is, as soon as they stand up, it's going to open up again, because you haven't done anything. You've just proven it. If it's arterial, they'll scream in agony. They'll have breast pain. If it's cancer, like a, you know, a margin ulcer or something else, it's just going to keep fungating. So it's a brilliant test, but it also explains the physiology of what we uh, now understand about veins. When you stand up, that's when things start going wrong. So from your heart to your foot, you have a column of blood. And that is the pressure at your ankles. And that pressure is measured by H rho G. G is gravity. So if you're on Earth, there is only one G. So that can't stay, okay? That is gravity. So unless you go to the moon or Jupiter, that is always the same. Rho is the density of your blood. If you're human, it is always going to be the same, okay? So the only thing that can change is your height. Now, presumably, all of you stay the same height as well. 
The only thing that changes is if you stand up, sit down, etc. So actually nothing changes the pressure at the ankle. So venous hypertension doesn't exist. No such thing. When you get varicose veins, you do not get more pressure at your ankles. This is an absolute misnomer. It's this idea because patients like to think, oh, you know, it's a good, oh, it's because it's more pressure. It's not more pressure. It's exactly the same unless you've got suddenly a lot taller or you're on Jupiter or you've got more dense blood. So we know that doesn't happen. So we'll come on to what it actually is, but it's worth sort of understanding this. Some people, there is a nuance if you want to, when you're walking because of the reflux, you get a slightly different pressure. So if you want to call that venous hypertension, you sort of can, but it's, it's really just a way of just arguing, which we do in the academic circles all the time. It's a really an argument, but it's not real. So in any case, uh, you, what you have to do is you measure the height of pressure of, of blood. The pressure is that minus the pressure that's actually coming through the capillaries. And when you're compressing someone, all you're doing is moving that up another 30 millimeters. So you're making someone stand up have the same pressure as someone sitting, and someone sitting have the same place as, as pressure as lying, which helps, and we'll come on to why that helps, but it doesn't cure. And it's why now the nice guidelines say for varicose veins, certainly compression is not a cure, never should be, and should only be used while you're sorting out how you're going to cure the patient. Now, there are some people, also, as you know, who are incurable. They, they are going to rely on compression. What, I'm to, what we'd have to do is we have to mix out those that are curable, those that are improvable, and those that are incurable. And you should be spending your time and resources on those and get rid of the curable ones for the good of the patients as much as anything else, and it's cheaper. Right, so what do we know about veins? What we know about veins is whether you believe in God, whether you believe in evolution, walking is the best exercise for veins. You put your foot down, you get a foot pump, which is the most powerful venous pump in the leg, or the smallest, smallest volume blood squirts into the calf, you move forward, the calf pumps into the thigh, thigh, pumps up, and provided your valves close, when you swing the leg forward, no blood falls back around your leg. That's how blood goes back to your heart. You've got to have two bits. You've got to have movement, and you've got to have the valves working. If your patient cannot move, if your patient has got a fused ankle and it's going to stay in bed or a, a, um, a wheelchair, nothing more that I'm going to say is irrelevant. Because there's no point in fixing all the valves, fixing all the veins, if they're never going to move. Because you have to have movement. So. When I go into a bit more depth about what we're going to talk about, do remember not, that's not correct for anyone who cannot move, because you have to have two parts to a pump, movement and valves. So, what do we know about veins? So this is going back to real sort of basics, but it's important because everyone seems to forget it in the UK, and that is you've got ankle, you've got knee, you've got hip, uh, groin area, and you've got heart. And for some reason, everybody thinks vein disease is here, and completely forgets all of that there. So when you've got a varicose seal as a man, you get sent to a urologist. When you've got hemorrhoids as a man or a woman, you get sent to a bowel surgeon. When you've got pain in your abdomen as a woman, one in three women who go to gynecologists with pain in the abdomen have got varicose veins around their ovaries, and it's called pelvic congestion syndrome. And almost all of them get misdiagnosed as um, endometriosis. Endometriosis uh, does exist. But only if you've got a big lump of endometrium. Most people who have the MRIs and have the laparoscopies actually have great big varicose veins there and actually have the inflammation they're calling endometriosis is often pelvic congestion syndrome. Now the gynecologists are trying to say, well, perhaps they appear together, but it's the, all the results show that one third of women in gynecology outpatients with discomfort have got pelvic congestion. Basically, it's the same number of boys who have got varicose seals, not surprisingly, because that's the male side of it. But because our test scores are on the outside and you see the veins on the outside, it gets diagnosed as a varicose seal. When ladies get it and they get dilated veins around the uterus, which are the veins that hurt, it gets misdiagnosed as something else. You hardly ever hear anybody talking about varicose seal in the ovary, do you? But how many kids do you see when you go to nursing school, when you go to medical school? It's one of the first things you learn about is a varicose seal around a man. And the anatomy is the same. It's just that in one state, the gonad is on the inside. So remember that we're talking about veins from the groin to the heart as well, because this, uh, it really annoys me when we only talk about things, all the veins are in the legs. Second thing of note is please remember all of the veins, when they're pumping, they should pump blood upwards and inwards, or inwards and upwards, but it's always back towards the heart. And that's what the valves do in the pumping. And it goes up the great saphenous vein, which is your axial vein, into the groin, and your small saphenous vein, which is your axial vein behind. If you ever hear a doctor or a report or a vascular technologist or a nurse saying long saphenous vein or short saphenous vein, walk out, 
they do not know anything about names. In 2001, the UIP changed all the names internationally because the LSV can mean long saphenous vein, but it can also mean lesser saphenous vein, and people are getting confused. And a research study in The Lancet also sh showed in the 90s, so it's about 96, showed that if you give reports to junior doctors and says there is a clot in the superficial femoral vein, 85% of them, I think it was 85 or 86%, think it's not a deep vein thrombosis because the word superficial is in there, even though it's a deep vein. It's only called superficial because it's next to the superficial femoral artery and there isn't a more superficial vein, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, vein called femoral. So it's a misnomer. So because of this, there's all this bad literature in the past where people haven't understood properly. So because of that, they changed all the names in Europe in 2001, and in America they agreed, and in 2004. So if anyone uses those old names, it means they haven't read any research or gone to any conference or kept up the veins since 2004 if it's America, 2001 if it's Europe. So 20 years out of date, which is more or less England at the moment. So that's a really simple test as to whether the person in front of you knows anything about veins. What we all know, we all know that when you see varicose veins, they're big bulgy veins on the calf or in the thigh. But what you have to remember the whole time, of course, is they've got an underlying cause. They don't just appear as varicose veins. So when someone comes out of varicose veins, you don't, it's not the bit you see that's important. The same as the lobster. It's not the bit you see that's important. It's what's the cause of it is the important thing. So if we agree that when we're standing up, you've got a pressure of HOG, and if we agree that when you're lying down, you've got pressure of 15 millimeters mercury, there's no difference between the person with the leg ulcer and the person with the varicose veins and the person without. What the research has shown is the difference is how you get there. So if you're lying down and you've got normal veins, when you stand up, over about 20 to 40 seconds, you slowly increase the pressure because blood goes out of your heart, down through your capillaries, comes out of the veins and slowly builds up that column. And because of that, it's nice and slow, you don't get any inflammation. If, however, you've got no valves, when you stand up, blood falls straight down, hits your ankle, and you get this sudden hit at the ankle. That is the difference. Now, those of you who've seen obstetrics before, if you give birth and it comes out, really comes out in five minutes, all sorts of tears. If it comes out in six hours, almost never a tear. If it comes out in 12 hours, definitely not a tear. Those of you who uh, have seen heart surgery, if you rip open the chest and have to get in quickly and you open the ribs in about 30 seconds, you always break the ribs because the muscles are so tense. If you put a spreader in into over 15 minutes, you never break the ribs. Same amount of trauma has totally different effects as to how quickly you do it. If you put a fist in someone's face and you push very, very slowly over 40 seconds and then do exactly the same total energy but in half a second, you'll have a very different result. One will knock them out, one will be in time to so you've got to remember, it's not only about the trauma, it's the rate of change. And this is why venous hypertension doesn't exist. What happens is it's the rate of change of pressure at the ankle. Okay? That's the difference. And all venous surgeons are doing is trying to find out why it's going to there and getting it back to there. So it's quite simple in a way. <laughs> now, this is a very, very interesting point. And this is totally relevant for all of you here if you're assessing patients with leg ulcers. The first thing is, say you've got the simplest form. Now, the simplest form of varicose veins is just reflux down the venous vein into varicose veins. That's what almost all doctors treat in the UK. In our study, fewer than 2%, it's so only, only about 1% of people have them. In fact, 99% is much more complex with that than coming from the pelvis, coming from perforators, which is why we do bad vein surgery in the UK, because we don't diagnose it right or treat it right. So what happens here is we end up with blood coming down here, falling down here, but instead of hitting the ankle, it gets caught up in these shock absorbers called varicose veins. It's a bit like a man on top of a, a very high building, a skyscraper, jumping off and hitting all of the awnings on the way down between two buildings. Gets to the bottom, stands up, bruised, mm. but walks off. That's shown by a very, very low amount of uh, inflammation at the ankle. Okay? Now, exactly the same, exactly the same problem, which is reflux in the great venous vein, standing up, but no shock absorbers, no varicose veins. This causes a sudden impact. It's the man jumping off, not hitting anything, hitting the ground and dying. The sudden deceleration causes mass inflammation. He's dead. And your ankle, this is what causes the problem. Now, unfortunately, you will recognise the people with varicose veins, but you won't recognise them. Because when you see them, they've got a leg ulcer, nothing else. Not a single varicose vein, but they've got varicose veins. 
they've got hidden varicose veins. You have to do a duplex, they've got them. And why it's important is that's curable, totally curable. You close that vein there with end of the surgery, totally cured. Okay? This is why varicose veins is really difficult because the person with the worst varicose veins when they're looking at them is in fact the most protected against ulcers. And the ones that have the ulcers are, tend to be the ones who don't show the varicose veins. So when they have their swelling, first of all, due to hidden varicose veins, they got some swelling, the GP gave them some stockings or some diuretics. Then when they went on and started getting some eczema, they gave them steroids. Then when they got the brown stains, they were given stockings and maybe a bit more steroids. When they got the ulcer, they said they got bandaging. At no stage did they get sent for the one thing they need, which is a venous duplex ultrasound, where it can be cured and stopped. So it's very, very important. That's why the NICE guidelines say you must send the patient for a duplex ultrasound to see that it is that and not something else. So we're just going to do a very, very little thing, which is in your red book correctly, but if you've ever read that blue book I've just been quoting, I've got to rewrite it because it's a bit out of date now. So the basic layout, you'll probably hear about deep and superficial veins. So the basic layout, deep veins are in the muscle, superficial veins are in the fat. So those are your deep veins, those are your superficial veins. That's what everybody's always said. Unfortunately, it's wrong. What the new nomenclature is, and it's very, very useful for both you and for me, and the reason I'll show you the difference, the deep veins inside the muscle, AC1, anatomical compartment 1, and network 1 veins, they're deep. That's the same as it always was. However, truncal veins don't sit in superficial fat, uh, fat. They sit in the superficial fascia. They have their own little fascial envelope. Why it's important for surgeons is when we put a laser or radio frequency up in there, we don't just put local anesthetic everywhere. We put it into that little envelope. And it means the local anesthetic is kept around the vein and it pushes that vein onto the laser. And we can actually use, it's called the Egyptian eye. You can actually close the vein onto the laser to get a really good uh, uh, amount of compression when we actually use uh, endovenous laser. So you get very, very, very good results if you do it properly. However, for your point of view, you cannot assess that patient. You can't see that because that's under fashion. You can't see that vein. So you, A, you can't see it. And B, even if you could see it, say your patient's cachectic, they've got some terrible disease, and you can see that vein, you don't know what the flow in it. So because of that, you cannot assess that patient clinically at all. And of course, AC3 veins, superficial veins here, are in the fat. So that's your third network of veins out in the side. So as I say, that's the new layers, and it's worth just knowing these differences, because it tells us a lot about which techniques we're going to use to treat patients and also how to investigate them. So as I said before, there are three elements of, um, of venous diseases, reflux, stasis, and obstruction. But all of them, whether you've got one of them, two of them, or three of them, all of them have the same foiling or common pathway, and it's chronic inflammation. Now, because I have dyslexia, I am very uh, good at building models and terrible academic work, and it really hurts me to write these books, and I think I'm, yeah, I'm not very good at it. But I have to build models, and it's very, very good for, I, I think, uh, being a dyslexic student, because it makes you have to think about things in models and, and dimensions. And so whenever I think about anything biological, I build complex models. But one of the simplest is actually how veins go wrong. And it's just basically a waterfall into a pool with a wall. And if you just imagine that, that's what's happening in a patient whose valves aren't working. The blood's falling down, it's collecting in veins around the ankle, either in varicose veins you can see, or the sub ulcer plexus. If you ever use an ultrasound to look under a net ulcer, there are huge veins everywhere. It's called the sub ulcer plexus, and we'll talk about that with stasis in a minute as to why they cause the ulcer. Then you have blood leaking out of the leg, and we think of that as like a wall. And the height of that wall obviously tells you the pool. When you get the inflammation, it can be because of the splashing of the reflux but it happens in the pool. It can be because the pool is so big that you're not getting much flow through it and all the millweed and everything else is there. Or it can be because the obstruction is so high it's made the pool very big and the same thing happens again. So when you're thinking about investigations, you want to think, we can treat this, we can treat this, we can treat that. So therefore your investigation has to be aimed at what you think is going on or has got to tell you which one is going on. Now, most of you will know this, that if you're fat, pregnant, got uh, compression in your um, uh, abdomen and you push down, your varicose veins go because your uh, top valve goes first, then the next, and the next. You've heard that, domino theory? Mm -hmm. It's bollocks. Totally wrong. <laughs> it's been shown to be absolutely wrong. It does not ever, ever happen. And this is really important because this is why a high tide doesn't work. And it's also why if you put a Doppler in the groin, it doesn't tell you what's going on because it's upside down. 
what we've found is, firstly, men and women have the same amount of varicose veins. The, the, the uh, Edinburgh study showed very clearly it's about 50-50 between men and women. The only reason women look like they've got varicose veins more than men, in my clinic, we keep up with figures all the time, we've got fantastic audits, we've got registries and everything, 75% of my patients are women, 25% of men. If you go into the street, it's 50-50. The difference, men do not turn up to doctors. Mm -hmm. Men are hopeless. And you can see that because if you look at bowel cancer, for instance, mm -hmm. bowel cancer is the same between the sexes. There's no difference. There's no sex difference between bowel cancer. But women survive longer because women think there might be something wrong. Mm -hmm. They go to the doctor, gets picked up at Duke's A. Men wait until they can't poo, or by the time it's in the liver or somewhere, and it's almost incurable. And that's the difference. Men are hopeless at turning up to doctors. It is not the disease that's different. It is actually the patient's response to the disease. And as a man, I can tell you, that's true. <laughs> so basically, what actually happens is the reflux starts low in the leg. So you start getting it somewhere low in the leg, and it starts going down for some reason. It's not as simple as the wall pulling apart. There's genetic things that have been were published, and there's all sorts of it. It's much more complex in its pace. It's not just physical. But what happens is one by one, the valves go, and the last valve to go, the last one is the one in your groin. When that happens, you've now got the rush of blood back down from your heart. And you'll hear people say all the time, I always had a little green vein here. Always, it's so there forever. One day it got really big. And what they're doing is when it's little and green, they're ascending, ascending, ascending. One day the last valve goes and it gets bigger. So that's phase one passive reflux, phase two. Why it's important for you to know is purely and simply, if you ever see anyone doing their quick duplex in the groin or doctor in the groin, a quick duplex on the knee, they're missing. In almost all the cases, they're missing the cause of the varicose veins. Second thing, not only if they say long speed, so you walk out. If a doctor does their own scan, walk out. If you don't have a specialist vascular technology to do scans day in, day out, they're not going to get good results. Now, this is a little thing. When I have the doctors come on my courses, as I said, the College of Phobology, we've never had any English doctors or nurses ever come on it because they don't regard phases as, as important, but we are inundated with people from abroad coming. And they come from all different countries, even America, which you think knows everything, but they, they still come to our courses. And I usually have them for four to six weeks, and <laughs> by which time you can say they're absolutely fed up with my voice. But one of the things I do, when consultants come in particular, they all think they know everything. And they all they sort of say, well, I've just come for a few pointers, but of course I treat veins already. And so I always just ask them this one question. And this is important for you because it's going to come on to one of the investigations afterwards. When your small saphenous vein has lost its valves, does that cause a problem? Because when you stand up, the HOG is tiny because all these valves are working here. So when you stand up, there's no reflux from above. You don't have that big amount of reflux. So I get all the doctors to agree that really small saphenous vein reflux isn't very important. But then I say, well, have you never seen anyone with a leg ulcer from a small saphenous vein? And when you close the small saphenous vein, it gets better. They all say, oh, yes. And you say, I'm very excited. And they so that what they know they do every day is different from their understanding. They suddenly realise they actually don't understand what they're doing, which is very common in surgery, I'm afraid. Um, you learn things by rote and you do them. So does anyone know how that works? Has anyone read my book before? Does anyone know? No. So what actually happens is it's a different form of reflux. So instead of standing up and gravity doing it, what happens is you've got to imagine that there's a fairy liquid bottle, that's your vein, and your hands are the calf muscle, and think about something a bit stickier than water, so a bit like treacle, and think how hard you have to push mm -hmm. to shoot that a metre and a half back the hard. Once you've got that in your mind, drill a hole between your fingers, and then push again. You get the same amount, by hemodynamics, you get the same force out both sides. That's when you get the reflux down your small sphenous vein. So it's not when you get, so when you're testing for Great saphenous vein varicose veins, you squeeze the leg, then look for reflux. Squeeze the leg, look for reflux with Doppler or duplex. Not for small saphenous. You look as you squeeze, because that's when it's happening, or certainly that's physiologically when it happens. If you understand that, and I hope all of you sort of think, oh yes, that makes sense, because mm -hmm. it does. The next thing is, of course, it's exactly the same for perforating veins. When perforating veins lose their valves, and they become incompetent. Whenever you walk, you actually get reflux. 
So we say to patients, you must walk, it's good for you. It's true, but if they've got perforating veins, they're actually causing more inflammation. We haven't published it at this moment in time, but it's, we presented at the UIP, and we're just about to publish a paper on 22,000 legs. And it's my colleague, Barry Price, and he's done a brilliant job over 20 years. And what he's done is map all the patients we've ever seen, and he's shown that three <coughs> incompetent perforators gives you the same damage at your ankle as one great saphenous vein or one small saphenous vein that's incompetent. However, how many doctors do you know that treat perforated veins? The answer, none. Because apart from our clinic where we invented the trollop technique, almost nobody in the country treats them for varicose veins, leg ulcers, or anything. Randomized controlled studies show for leg ulcers, you have to treat the perforators to get good results. And for C4, C3 has just been proven, C2 will be shortly proven because it's part of the progression. So people go to these cheap vein clinics and going everywhere who just have the great venous, small venous, and then they say, but all my veins came back a year later, you know, what's gone wrong? They didn't even have the whole operation. They didn't have all the points of reflux closed in the vast majority of patients. That's the problem. Veins are not as simple as just two veins. There's about 160 different points of reflux that any one or combination can happen in varicose veins, C3, C4, and right up to leg ulcers. And if you don't find them all and correct them all, you don't get a good result. That's the problem with randomised controlled studies. When you do them and you say, we've got to have five hospitals, and four of the hospitals have got doctors who don't know what they're doing, the results aren't good. And that's one of the difficulties. Well, people say, well, that's the real world, but it's also not telling us much about science. We won't go into this too much, but just to say the hemodynamic people don't agree with me, and this is one of the reasons they're definitely wrong, because we've actually got patients who have like three, perf uh, three perforators in the leg ulcer, so you close the perforators, the leg ulcer disappears. So this is, the hemodynamic side has been proven to be wrong. The last of them all is obstruction, of course, and I won't go into this too long, but it's very important because you will probably see in your patients more obstructive cases than is usual for the rest of us. You can have Mayferna where the right, uh, the right common iliac artery pushes on the left common iliac vein and causes a narrowing. That's called Mayferna syndrome. You might have nivel, which is non-thrombotic iliac vein lesion, which basically is a valve in the uh, deep veins in the pelvis that isn't working anymore, but is acting as a sort of like a little gate to stop blood getting out. Um, very hard to find. Or you might find, and this is more common in your patients, which is post-thrombotic syndrome. People have had a DVT before, and I'm sure you've been trained to, and you ask, have they had a DVT before? What you might not be aware of is the work from Vaughan Ruckley, uh, Professor Vaughan Ruckley from Edinburgh, who showed that if you have one deep vein thrombosis and it's cured really quickly, you have heparin straight away and it clears within a couple of months, you almost never get post thrombotic syndrome. So when patients come in and say, but I've had a DVT before when I had appendicitis and stuff, was it treated well? Yes, it did. Have you ever had one again there? You scan the legs, you can't find they've ever had one. You only get post-thrombotic syndrome and real problems with your deep veins if you have either multiple DVTs over a long time or you have a DVT that's very extensive and was not cured. Basically, it took a long time or it was missed. Now, sometimes a patient might come in and say, I've only had one DVT, and you look at the scans and they've got the most horrible post-thrombotic syndrome. The reason for that is often they've got thrombophilia and when, when they were younger, they kept on having DVTs, but they were told it was a sports injury or a muscle strain. So sometimes it's a misdiagnosis. But the most important thing is don't write off people just because they've told you they've got a DVT. Make sure, you've, make sure they've had a, uh, some sort of um, scan or whatever, and we'll talk about which ones in a minute, to check what is going on. Now, say you've got someone who's had a DVT, and the, uh, they get a duplicate scan saying that you've got reflux in the deep veins, about 90% of them also have obstruction. <coughs> Why is that important to you? It's important to you because if you send them and they have a stent, that will clear the obstruction and the deep vein reflux is suddenly a lot less important. And when you do compression afterwards, you cure them for longer and you cure them easier and they get longer times of, of good practice. So sometimes the mixing of these different uh, modalities actually gives the best results. Those of you who work with vascular surgeons, artery surgeons, don't really understand this, the artery surgeons, what happens in the artery, if you've got a very high pressure and high um, flow rate vessel, and you start getting a narrowing in it, you can measure that narrowing. And therefore, when people look at CT scans or imaging of veins, they look for narrowings. The trouble is in a vein, when you're lying in CT scanner, you're on your back. And if you're a bit dehydrated or anything, you quite often see a narrowing. And you might misdiagnose that as Mayferna. The trouble is when you walk, your veins dilate. Mm. 
And so quite often, if you see a narrowing, but don't measure the function, you think that there is a narrowing and there isn't. Whereas a true narrowing will actually get worse when you try to force it, because the vein bulges more. So we never, where's arteries? It's all about is there a stenosis or not, like carotids, not the veins. Veins, you only look at function. Finally, stasis, if your arterial flow into capillaries and out of veins, if that doesn't happen, either there's a reflux, obstruction, or you're just not moving, the little cells in here all eat away the, the oxygen, make carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide and water gives you your acid. And you're basically, all your, why stasis veins cause a problem is because they just cause these massive areas of acid that then just start causing inflammation all the way through down to the skin. Treatment for this, of course, is you can compress and empty that, which is good, but much better if you foam sclerotherapy this first, then compress, you get better results for longer, and even if they take it off a bit, the foam actually is helped because it's dropped those away. So sometimes combining treatments with compression actually give you great initial results for the faster healing and long-term results. So clinical examination, you can tell what clinical stage you're at, but you cannot tell anything else, whether it's reflux, stasis, you can't tell where it's coming from. So clinical examination is pretty useless for anything. It, you can only tell what's there, you can't tell what's not there or what's deep. So investigations need to be functional. If you have an image only, if you ask for a CT, an MRI or anything, there's no function, it is useless. And Vida Brown is pretty useless for that. So the function of this case is plexmography, Doppler and duplex. Plexmography is not used so much in this country anymore. It's an older test, but in fact we're now re we've got some new inventions coming out with this. And it shines an infrared light into the leg Gets the, re, um, gets the reflection, and there's a direct correlation to the size of the veins in the capillaries, the venules, how much they absorb and how much is reflected. So by using it, this plethysmography in this way, put a plethysmograph just above the ankle, do 10 movements to mimic walking, and then stop and just wait. You get these traces. Normal, 10 movements, slow refill. This is the opposite of the pressure. That tells you you've got no varicose veins. 10 movements, fast refill, you've got great big reflux. You see, it's, it looks exactly like but it's not invasive. The problem being, as I said before, the incompetent perforators and the small sphenous vein is all in here. And nobody has ever worked out this bit of the curve before. So we're doing a lot of machine learning and everything in my research department at the moment to try and see if we can get both sides. So it's good for truncal reflux, it's terrible for small sphenous vein reflux, it's terrible for perforated vein reflux. So it's not a great test apart from a very simple screening test. Air plethysmography, there's only one, there's several parts of it in the, the books, but the single cuff, which was invented by uh, Evie Kadaliki, who unfortunately died recently, and her husband, uh, Chris Latimer, who still does this. They're the only people who do it in the UK, unfortunately, at the moment. You put a cuff around the leg, and if you're in Germany, you strap the patient to a table, turn the table upside down and see what happens. In England, unfortunately, we can't strap people to tables, they usually say no. So what you do is you get them to throw themselves back and lift their leg up. If they've got no obstruction, blood just falls straight out, and you get this curve. If, on the other hand, there's a narrowing, you get a really slow curve. So no MR, it's nothing expensive, just a very simple, relatively cheap test done, and you can tell if there's an obstruction, and then do the MRI if you need it. But don't subject people to all these big tests if there's, if there's good function, because they don't need it. The great thing in this is once you stand up again, you then get the reflux test and you can see whether they've actually got reflux or not. So you get two for the price of one with that one. And you get these and you get a report. I don't read those, but I get a lovely report from Chris. Doppler is useless for veins. It's great for your ABPIs, for the arteries. For veins it's useless because you don't know what you're insulating. You can't see where you are. And so it's useless. Nowadays we all use duplex ultrasound. Colour flow duplex ultrasound, by convention, these are your legs down here, this is your head here. And although the patient is actually standing up, we always show these horizontal. So remember, gravity is going that way. The little blue, that little blue, is the squeeze, that's the blood going up. And look how much reflux is coming down. Now you might think that's strange, that there's more coming down than going up. That's because it's all coming from the other veins around. We've almost finished. Perforators are very easy to see on duplex ultrasounds, but unfortunately because doctors can't treat them very well, they don't often um, look for them or treat them. This is pelvic veins for pelvic congestion syndrome. You can actually see it relatively easy if you do what's called a transvaginal duplex. So therefore, all of these imaging tests are useless if you haven't established whether there's a functional problem first. So,
Conclusions. Number one, you cannot assess clinically. Do not think you can assess your patient, talk to them, do an ABPI, and you're safe. You're not. The old lady also, nice guidelines, you must ask for a venous duplex ultrasound. If you can't get one locally, make absolutely certain it's in the notes that you as a professional asked for it and tried to refer it, and it was rejected. You're covered. Okay? But if you don't put the pressure in the system, it will never change. You need to know the function, only get imaging of the functions down, know what you're looking for, think about it, and uh, remember, no single test will ever tell you everything, but duplex will tell you most of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely, no time for questions.